Hi everybody. Okay, so this is the class for Friday the 22nd of April. Uh, the class number 40, the last one of the semester. This is going to be a short one, but I just wanted to first of all give you some announcements reminding you that the homework assignment number 12 should be uploaded to Blackboard by 5 o'clock on Friday the 22nd. And then regarding the final exam, this is just to reiterate what we talked about in class on Wednesday that uh, that exam is going to be from 10.15 to 12.15 in our normal classroom location. You should bring a computer with the four software packages that we've used so far this semester because uh, you'll get at least one problem that um, you'll need to use that software for. And uh, you can bring a page of formulas and problem-solving notes, uh, but the page of formulas and problem-solving notes that you bring in shouldn't include any concept definitions or terminology. Uh, because those questions I expect you to answer um, just from your own understanding. And then just a related note with the software, you'll have to start with a blank worksheet. You can't just modify a previously solved homework problem or example. And so if that guides what you put down on your page of notes, just keep in mind that you could have, for example, a step-by-step -step process if you want to refresh your memory on how to do certain things. Okay, so we've concluded all of the groundwater flow material that I wanted to share with you, and so therefore uh, the remainder of this lecture video is just going to be a brief review of a couple of concepts from earlier in the semester. Um, this is three concepts that as I went back through the notes it seemed like um, could use some additional attention simply because maybe a lot of people struggled with it on the exam, or it's maybe a pretty complicated process that I wanted to refresh your memory on. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot of other topics included on the exam and things that we've covered this semester that won't be in this concept review, but this is just kind of meant as an appetizer to help you kick off your preparation for our test. Okay, so now that we've covered the material related to uh, groundwater flow, let's dig into a couple of slides that are related to preparing for the final. Um, the first question or the first topic I'd like to go over is just refreshing your uh, understanding of the sequence of events that starts with air rising upward and concludes in precipitation coming from the sky. And so remember that uh, air can move upward from a variety of effects. There's convergence where um, a warm front and a cool front come together or converge on a location and that's what drives the air movement upward. There's orography, which is where um, air is forced to move over an obstacle like a mountain. And because of that physical obstacle, it rises. And then the third cause of uplift would be convection, which is those afternoon thunderstorms that arise when the sun is shining downward on the ground, heats the air at the surface, and then because it's heated, it begins to rise. So for whichever of these three reasons, um, this rainfall process begins with warm, moist air rising upward. And then um, because atmospheric pressure is lower as you go up through the atmosphere in the same way that uh, water pressure is lower as you go upward through uh, water. Anytime you go upward through a fluid, the pressure is decreasing and the same thing is true in our atmosphere and so that air that is being forced upward is experiencing decreased pressure and because of the decreased pressure then it's going to expand and so just think about a certain packet of air maybe it's a, a cubic meter of air at the ground surface that as it went upward uh, and pressure decreases it's expanding and there's a relationship between expanding gases and cooling and so as it cools, the mass of water is constant. And so on an absolute basis, the moisture hasn't changed. But because air can absorb less water at cooler temperatures, uh, the relative humidity is going to increase. So water is less soluble at cooler air temperatures. And so as the air is rising through the atmosphere, the relative humidity is increasing and eventually it's going to reach saturation, meaning 100% relative humidity. And when that occurs, um, as the air continues to cool further, then that excess moisture 
has to go somewhere. And where it goes is it begins to condense on little particles that are in the atmosphere. And those may be everything from dust particles to um, droplets of uh, salts, if, if we're talking about oceans and coastal areas. It could be other water droplets that had already condensed. So that excess moisture is going to begin to condense and those droplets will grow and eventually the size of the droplets is large enough that their weight exceeds the buoyant effect uh, where when they're small those little particles can be kept aloft just by gusts of wind uh, the, the movement of the air molecules will keep it aloft but eventually um, as it gets heavy enough then they'll fall downward through the atmosphere and that's precipitation um, so my impression on our first midterm exam was that most students didn't understand in sufficient detail that entire sequence of events and um, I'm not sure that I'll give you the exact same question on the final exam um, but there may be a related question uh, on the final exam to something that was already asked on one of the other midterms so I think it's important to uh, review your understanding of the causes of precipitation the second topic that I would like to review, in part because it seemed like this wasn't well and understood in the first midterm exam, is uh, from that video that we watched, which was called Water Movement in the Soil. Um, I think that was a video that's put online from a university in Belgium. I'd encourage you to watch it again. It's only 16 minutes long, and it's like uh, getting a whole semester's education and water movement through soil in 16 minutes. Here's the link if you want to... I guess you can't click on it, but maybe type that in. Um, so what we observed in that video, uh, I think that this, uh, this one of the experiments that they illustrated was particularly instructive because what we had was water being added to loam up, up above from a pipette. And you can see that there's a little bit of pooling. They carved out a depression in the loam so that we could have a free surface of water and that's important because what it tells you is that here there's a hundred percent saturation in these particles that are in the immediate vicinity of that pool of water all of the voids are full of moisture um, but the interesting thing that we wouldn't necessarily expect is that the water continued to move outward radially sideways the water is moving sideways instead of going down now, if there's only one thing that you've learned this semester, I hope it's that water flows downhill. Um, and so maybe the more precise way to put that is that water flows from locations of high energy to locations of low energy. So um, when we're beneath the surface, it's not just the elevation that factors into the energy, but it's also the suction head. And so that's kind of at the heart of the explanation for why does the water move sideways instead of going down through the sand. You know, what is it about this dry sand that, if not repelling the water from above it, because it's not necessarily repelling the water, it's just uh, something about the sand can't suck it down in in the same way that lo the loam is able to. So uh, if we look back at the uh, soil parameters that's provided in our textbook, what we're comparing is sand and loam. And maybe the first place that someone uh, might look in comparing and contrasting these two soils is at the hydraulic conductivity. And the hydraulic conductivity for sand is much higher than for the loam. And so what that speaks to is how easily the water is able to move through the sand um, when the soil voids are full of water. And so water can move through sand much more easily than it can move through loam. The units here are length per time, so centimeters per hour. Um, once the water gets into the sand in this previous slide, um, it's going to progress through the sand more quickly than it's moving through the loam. So it's not the hydraulic conductivity that explains that odd behavior that we're seeing, but rather it's the wetting front soil suction head. I sometimes just refer to that as the suction pressure in the soil. And what you'll notice is that the loam has a higher soil suction head. And so what this is, is a measure of the force or the, um, I guess it's, it's the pressure that the soil is drawing the fluid through. And because the, uh, the suction head is greater in the loam, then that means that 
a molecule of water that is here at the border between the wet area, or at least in this zone, it's the, the voids are partially full. It may not be completely saturated, but there's some water in these voids, and these are completely dry. So why is it that the water chooses to move sideways rather than downward? It's because it's going to where there's the greatest suction. So it's moving in the downhill direction, so to speak. And so there's more negative suction head to the right in the dry loam than there is downward into the sand. And so uh, the answer here is just by looking at the wetting front soil suction head. And so the conclusion we can draw from that is that the water in the loam voids are going to flow sideways towards other empty loam voids where the suction pressure is higher until once those loam voids are filled and the suction pressure is reduced then the water will be go, begin to go downward through the sand and so in this diagram where we did see the water begin to enter the sand it was right under where the water is being applied because this was the region of the loam that became a hundred percent saturated first where all of the voids were full of water and once the suction pressure in this mostly full loam was equal to the suction pressure of the sand then the water would penetrate downward because the suction pressures being equal then the water will flow downward uh, because of the added effect of gravity okay so that's an important uh, way to understand movement through the subsurface and and again I'd encourage you to watch that video I think it's a great refresher for how water behaves in uh, the subsurface and this last point that I wanted to review is the declining potential infiltration rate curve um, in our exam I just asked you to sketch it so you didn't necessarily even have to explain it um, but enough people struggled to sketch that curve that it makes me think that it would also be a challenge to describe what's happening and why so let's go over that again uh, just to review what we observe in this curve the uh, potential infiltration rate here on the vertical axis begins at a relatively high value and uh, what we can think of is that the uh, soil is dry at that beginning of the storm that the voids are empty and so the suction pressure is going to be high initially but then as time continues and the duration since the storm began moves further and further you'll notice that the uh, infiltration rate is decreasing until it finally reaches some minimum infiltration rate so this as I've kind of already tipped my hand at is largely also related to the soil suction head and so um, the green amped method is one way of trying to describe the rate of infiltration and the green amped simplification was just that we know the wetting front is curved but it's easier from a math standpoint if we think of it as a binary uh, change from fully filled voids down to the initial moisture content and so the water is pooling at the top of the surface and that wetting front moves down through the soil column and um, initially when L is small if we just look at the equation that describes the infiltration rate so here's a simplified formula for estimating the infiltration rate and it says that we would have the hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the soil suction head plus the length of the wetting uh, front divided by the length of the wetting front so if L is small then it being in the dynamic in the um, denominator of this expression is going to give us a high infiltration rate but then as L gets larger and larger, it being in the denominator is going to reduce F because although it's also in the numerator, it's added to the soil suction head. So um, from a physical standpoint, what we can think of is that as the water is penetrating down through the soil, whatever driving force is drawing the water into the soil is decreasing. Um, there's less of a suction effect and so the rate of infiltration will go down um, and uh, and really that's it we just have to keep in mind that when the length of the penetration is relatively small then the infiltration rate is larger and so just to sketch out this declining potential infiltration rate curve 
Um, what we see is eventually it reaches that minimum, which is associated with just the suction wetting front and the hydraulic conductivity. And when the, the, when the suction effect has been completely um, neutralized because all of the voids are filled, then it's just gravity drawing the, the water. Okay, so that is it for the review. I will see you for the final exam on Friday the 29th. And in the meantime, as you're studying, if you've got any questions or if there's anything I can help you with, uh, please just get in touch.